right, everybody. Uh, my name is Tom Davis. I'm the Director of Partnerships at Signpost, and I am really excited to be talking with some of our partners here on our Contractors Corner. Uh, we've got our friends from Contractor Coach Pro here today. We've got Nathan Thibodeau and Rosalind Burgess uh, with us to talk about, you know, hiring the right people at every stage of your business. You know, we want to make sure that, that you're making those right decisions and, and uh, certainly putting your best foot forward with the business. So, y'all, welcome to the uh, welcome to the webcast series. Uh, you know, I'd love to get y'all to introduce yourselves. Tell us a little bit about, you know, who you are, your background in working with contractors. And I've got a hot topic question. Is pineapple an appropriate pizza topping? So, Nathan, kick it off, man. Wow. Uh, all right. So... Uh, my name is Nathan Thibodeau, and uh, I started in the contracting industry when I was 15 years old. So uh, I've got about 25 years in this business. I have done everything from picking up junk on the ground to cleaning up the job site to uh, running a full-scale contracting company, which I did for 15 years um, and uh, also worked a little bit with security contractors in the security industry as well, um, and then uh, moved into doing full-time coaching with Mr. Jim Johnson a little over three years ago. And so uh, that's what I do now. Uh, basically, we, uh, we inspire people to believe that's, that's our, our purpose at Contractor Coach Pro. And um, my official role there, uh, if there is one, is, uh, is janitor, number one. And then number two, it's, uh, it's lead coach. So uh, it's part of my job to make sure that everybody that comes to us looking for help finds the help that they need through uh, our coaching and all of our awesome team that we have. So, and pineapple. Um, I actually am fine with pineapple on a pizza. If I ordered my own pizza, it probably wouldn't have pineapple on it. But if it has it, I will eat it and I will not pick it off and I will probably enjoy it as well. All right. All right. I dig it. Well, Rosalind, how about yourself? Tell us about you and your background. Yeah, sure. Well, I have kind of a weird HR background in that I did uh, HR for probably about 12 to 13 years, um, both in very large scale settings, so working for a Fortune 500 company, um, and then transitioned to doing all kinds of uh, small business help, working with small businesses and helping them establish their own uh, processes and procedures. Um, but I also have a background in marketing, which is a little strange. You don't usually see kind of that creative and the, oh, the, not, HR. Not in the HR space. No, yeah. Yeah, but I've really. Uh, loved using those things together to think about how we can kind of integrate some marketing tactics into our employee experience uh, and coach people to think a little differently about HR. It's not just that boring legalistic, that it really can be fun, um, that it can be a way that you love and care for your team well um, and really infuse your culture into everything that you do. So that's kind of how I came to CCP or the background that I came to CCP with. And I joined back in October when they needed an HR specific coach. Uh, and it's awesome. been a blast. Yeah. Well, I love that you mentioned the marketing background because uh, y'all, once the video is done in the YouTube description, we'll have access to an infographic that Roz is putting together for us. It's going to walk through the stages of the business, kind of some things to be aware of. So uh, looking forward to seeing uh, those two backgrounds blend. Absolutely. Yeah. And well, you, you, you can't avoid the topic. Pro pineapple pizza, or is this like, uh, we, we don't do that? Okay, well, Tom, I've never met a pizza I didn't like. So <laughs> my standards are really low, like frozen Jack's pizza to, you know, the best New York pizza. Doesn't yeah. matter if I'm having it. Yeah. Um, I love pizza. And so pineapple would definitely not be a turnoff for me. Um, but honestly, the best way to eat pineapple is to roast it over a campfire. Ooh, I don't know. right there for people at home. There you go. So next time we go camping this summer, as, as uh, we get back to kind of our normal routines, please don't sleep on the uh, wood grilled pineapple. Thanks for the tip there. Yeah, you bet. Awesome. All right, y'all. Well, we've got about a half hour to kind of talk through all things, scaling your business, hiring, HR needs, things like that. Um, as I did mention before, we will have a downloadable PDF for you in the description. So uh, that way you don't have to remember all this off the top of your head. You'll have a takeaway to, to really make sure that you can, can put some of these tips into practice. So with that being said, let's go ahead and jump right in. Uh, I know that we've been you know, talking uh, in the background around hiring for the business and, and what does the right person look like. I'm kind of curious at a high level, when you say, you know, I need to hire the right people for, for my job, 
what do you kind of mean by like the right people, right? Like, what does that mean? Are there, are there things you're looking for or, or how do you kind of decide who's a, a good fit or not? It's a good question. Um, I'll, I think I might jump on the first part of that question, which uh, I think the first, the first thing you have to understand is kind of who you are as a company. What is your personality? What, what's the temperament there? Are you guys really laid back? Are you really aggressive? Are you very competitive? Are you real family feel kind of place? Um, your culture, in essence, kind of decides um, what kind of people we're looking for. Like, you know, I mean, I, I've, I've looked, talked to businesses where they were very, very sports emphasized, right? And so if they, if they were interviewing with somebody who, who they didn't know if they were a right fit for the company or not, and they found out this person's favorite hobby was collecting stamps. They may not have enough in common with the rest of the team to really mesh and fit well, right? And there might be another company out there where everybody collects something, coins and stamps and rare oddities, right? So who you are as a company is kind of the first question you got to answer. But there's another component of it that's a little more strategic, which I'll let Roz kind of talk a little bit about. Yeah, I think the strategy piece that you want to pay attention to is really looking at where your organization is at from a growth standpoint. Um, you really want to try to identify what are the needs of your organization, um, and that will really drive what kind of people you should be hiring for, uh, which roles, when, and what are some of those HR things you should be thinking about as you're hiring as well. All right, well, let me ask you that. So you're talking about where you are kind of in your growth stage. Is it pretty easy to silo? Like, how do you tell where people are within their various business stages? Well, uh, we have kind of identified maybe four major places. Now, there's a lot of nuance to this stuff because everybody's companies are a little bit different. Yeah. Um, and the, the differences in their companies and the nuance will oftentimes depend on the owner. If the owner's a very process-driven person, the back end of their business might be pretty well set up, but the sales side and the marketing side are what need help. In a lot of cases, the owner's totally different. The owner's a very sales-minded person, a very marketing-minded person, but the back end of the business just doesn't. So there's a lot of nuance to this. So don't think we're trying to oversimplify it, but the four major stages that we typically see are like the one-person show. Um, this is, uh, this is you know, a very, very small company. Maybe they just got started or maybe they've been operating this way for a really long time. The, um, the second phase that we see are the friends and family team. So as you try to grow your business, you're looking for help. And the usually the most immediate readily available help is the help within an arm's reach of yourself, right? Um, and then you have the casting the wider net phase. And um, we can talk about these in detail as well. But casting a wider net, we start expanding beyond what we can just reach our arms out and, and grab. And then as you move beyond that stage, you start to find this concept of building and scaling or building your company to scale. Uh, those are kind of the four major components that we, we seem to see in, at least from the hiring aspect for businesses. Mm -hmm. yeah. cool. All right. Well, I mean, with that being said, you, you kind of walk through, like you said, uh, the, the solo owner, the friends and family, you're kind of casting that wider net and then trying to understand how to build to scale. You know, what is... What does stage one look like? You know, what are some of those challenges that the solo owner is dealing with on a daily basis that um, maybe they don't realize they're dealing with because it's always been a part of their process? And, and yeah, I would love to kind of understand more about what, what does an individual in that stage look like and, and kind of what tips and tricks do you give them? Well, the solo owner, um, oftentimes they get referred to lovingly as uh, Chuck in a truck. Uh, I heard recently Jan in a van. There you I'm go. a, fan, That's of that. I'm a fan of that one. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, uh, Jan might drive a van. I don't know, but Jan in a truck just doesn't sound quite. No, as no, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's got to roll off the tongue. So these are people who are doing everything. Like they're, they're marketing, they're doing their sales, they're building their estimates and proposals. They're, they're uh, ensuring the work gets done. Like they're handling everything start to finish. They might have a helper, an assistant. They might have a full-time person, maybe. So it's one to two people typically in this phase. Uh, Revenue-wise, they're generally from, from zero, hopefully more than that, um, all the way up to probably about one to one and a half million. It seems like, you know, if you hit one million to one and a half on your own, that's a lot to handle. Yeah, and so that's kind of that description in phase one, at least, of what that looks like. 
Right on. And, and I'm curious, like if you got one, two people, Roz, you know, are people thinking about, you know, HR and business practices on the back end there, or are they just trying to survive? Like, how do you kind of generally work with folks in this stage? Yeah, I think they are probably in that survival mode. And when they're starting to hit that point of like, man, this is just too much to handle. Yeah. Um, that's really when they're starting to realize, like, I think I'm going to need some people and I have no idea necessarily how to go about that or yeah. how to identify what to hand off. Um, so one of the things I think that is a great first step is to start kind of documenting your process. How do you do things? Um, how do you work? I also think you can start to identify what are some of those things that you could take off your plate. Nathan mentioned that you might have an administrative yeah. uh, assistant or somebody like that. Um, what are those things that if you were to bring somebody on and help them um, kind of take some of the load for you, would you want to hand off to them right away? And how would you document those process for those processes for them so that they know how to do what it is that you'd like help with? So I'm giggling over here because if I put myself in this situation, I'm thinking, what are the tasks that I like least like and who can I pawn those off on? Yes. Is, that, that, is that generally the safe bet there? That's pretty much what they're doing and what they should be doing. I mean, really, it's a good business strategy to do the work that you love and let other people kind of do the stuff that you don't want to do. All right. So for the solo owners chiming in, your first hire is for the tasks that you, you like doing the least. And that is an A-OK -okay business strategy. You heard it from Roz. Uh, so that's well and Believe it or not, there are people out there that like doing things you don't. It's hard to, it's hard to imagine, but it's true. <laughs> Tough, man. That's, yeah. I, just take it all. Take it all. That's the way to do it. Uh, all right. So let me ask you this. We got Chuck in a truck. We got Jay in a van. They maybe have an assistant, somebody that's kind of helping lower uh, maybe some of those responsibilities. Um, you know, Nathan, when we were talking kind of before this chat, uh, you you had a really interesting point at this phase, and I'm kind of curious if you can elaborate a bit on it, which is, you know, as you're hiring maybe for these tasks that you don't like doing, you phrase it as a way of like, what frees you up to generate revenue? You know, what are those things that you see people doing? Okay, now that I've got XYZ tasks off my plate, I need to focus on element OP. Um, you know, what are we doing with that extra money that we're bringing in now that we've got somebody to kind of take some of that that day-to-day -day work off your plate to really focus in the business? That's a, that's a great question. Um, and it's a chicken before the egg kind of thing I hear with guys oftentimes. They're like, well, I need to generate revenue, which means I need to hire somebody to help me generate revenue. Yeah. Not necessarily. What you may need to do is hire somebody who can allow you to go generate more revenue. And so, and the, and the thing you have to remember is as you generate that revenue, you need to be reinvesting that revenue back into your business if your intention is to grow it. If your intention isn't to grow it, then you and this new person make really, really good money. There's nothing that says you can't keep that yourself. But if the idea is to scale your business or to grow it into something, uh, then you need to keep your keep yourself paying uh, modest and then reinvest that money back into your company. But hiring somebody to do some of these other time-consuming things should do one of two things. Either A, generate more revenue, B, allow you to generate more revenue, or C, I said two, so we're out to three, uh, give you more time, give you more time. All right. And that exchange and that exchange for the cost of that person is usually well worth it. Got it. Okay, cool. Right on. That's good to know. Um, well, I, I kind of want to move from that solo owner, uh, piece from, from the kind of two person is, you know, once we kind of graduate above there, right, we are taking the advice we're, we're, we've hired somebody to, to help us free up for new revenue. We're now taking that revenue, reinvesting it into the business. We're reaching this kind of growth stage where we can kind of start to bring on more people. Uh, I think you mentioned that as like the friends and family piece. You know, what at what point do you say, you know, hey, cousin Larry or brother Bob, whoever it may be, you know, I need a little bit of extra help. And and Roz, like, are there potential pitfalls there as you are bringing on family to set proper expectations? I just imagine, you know, a, a knockdown drag out fight over over you know Thanksgiving dinner or something like that. So how do we avoid that? Yeah, absolutely. I think, well, the first I would say is really when you get to those pinch points of like, I'm not doing the things that are going to make our organization the most money. I'm no longer effective because my time is too strapped. I'm investing it in areas that aren't going to see the return. I think that's a clear indicator that you're ready to bring on some friends and family. And it's a good idea to hire those people that you already know and trust. They're people that are in your circle. Yeah. Um, but like you mentioned, Tom, that can come with some conflict if 
if you don't prepare for it. And I think there are just three really simple things that you can do to help kind of make that relationship successful with your friends and family. Um, and they're all kind of related around the same thing, which is communication. The first is to have really clear job descriptions. Okay, what is each person kind of responsible for? What are their expectations? Um, it just allows people to know how they work together. And then that creates a lot of a lot less tension uh, between who's doing what. The other thing is to have an employee handbook at that stage. You're kind of at the four and a half, or I'm sorry, one and a half to four million now in this stage. And so you're ready to have an employee handbook. Um, chances are you might have some extra revenue that you can invest into providing maybe paid time off or some simple benefits for your, uh, for your team. And so having those things spelled out, even if you don't have a full employee handbook, at a minimum, you should have some basic HR policies documented for people. Okay. Um, and then that kind of ties into that third piece, which is accountability and performance management process. If you do have somebody on your, uh, on your team that's not quite meeting expectations, if you personally are prepared for how you're gonna deal with that, it's just gonna make those conversations go a lot easier um, it's data driven instead of kind of feel right like oh I feel like somebody's not working well that can lead to a lot of tension right. Yeah. Um, but when we have actual performance management processes and we have accountability systems in place, it kind of takes some of that guesswork out and people know what's expected of them on the front end. Got it. Very cool. Okay. And, and uh, I, do you see generally and this might be too broad of a, a kind of a paint stroke here but do you see that people that hire uh, maybe family members over friends generally have better success long term. Do you find that people that go straight to their friends maybe do better because it's not uh, such a personal affair or, or is there really no way to tell there? It's just a natural, the friends and family thing is such a natural progression. And the reason is because it, as your business starts to grow, opportunities are happening. Yeah. Like we're, we're generating some revenue. I could use some help. Yeah. And why would I not first immediately think about the people I love and the people I trust to come help me? And they just happen to need a job or, or maybe they're just graduating from high school or they just got out of college. Right. Or maybe yeah. they're transitioning in their life somehow. And the first people we always want to help naturally are those around us. And so I, I don't know that there, there aren't a whole lot of companies that don't go through that phase, at mm -hmm. least in a short term for a while. Now, how long it lasts, that's, you know, that's a, that's a totally different thing. And, you know, as, a, as an aside, oftentimes the people that helped you bootstrap and build your business are not going to end up, end up being the ones that are there over the long haul. Yeah. You know, businesses have phases and they have seasons, you know, like, I mean, I, I just played volleyball the other day and I definitely played as much as I used to when I was younger. Yeah. I definitely can't do that as much as I used to when I was younger, right? And so your business has the same thing. I'm yeah. going to have to let that phase go, sure. I hope, uh, you know? And so that friends and family thing is just a natural progression. And I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that you called out that example. I got suckered into playing flag football last fall and I blew my rock. <laughs> So yeah, like, I'm too old for that, man. I feel like <laughs> that season has set, you know, we, we there. and, and uh, Roz, I, I really appreciate you calling out, really setting that proper expectation with like the communication, the job description, accountability. So I grew up in a landscaping family and, and my dad as family business, uh, you know, ended up being 70 years old before he kind of retired at all. But um, he hired my cousin and, and my dad, you know, great man, but not always the best at communicating what expectations are. And, and he and my cousin ended up having a massive falling out because they had a huge disagreement over how the business should be run. And, and it, uh, you know, they were both at fault, but I think that if both of them kind of could have put their pride and ego aside and just said, Hey, let's have a heart to heart sit down around where we think the business is going. And let's, to your point, Roz, let's show those data points. Like let's, let's kind of resolve this and figure out how to navigate the business moving forward. But Unfortunately, they uh, they weren't willing to kind of sit down and, and really have that hard, yeah. hard, tough talk, and um, you know they had to go their separate ways. But um, so that's, that's yeah. incredibly important. You know, something I wish that they had known a long time ago. But uh, for those folks that are hitting that stage, you know, making sure that you are really setting that expectation is going to go so far. Right, and I think Tom, sometimes the hesitation around that isn't for a lack of wanting to do it because yeah. you know I a lot of my clients they're like I've known for like years. I should have a job description or an employee handbook. And it's just really like 
needing somebody to sometimes come alongside them and help them think through what are the specific things that should should be on paper and what should that look like. And so I think a lot of times it's not for a lack of knowing that they need it or wanting it, but more so um, really carving out the time or having the help to kind of map out some of those pieces too. And it doesn't have to be boring. I mean, I think that's where I try to infuse some of that, yeah. that marketing life into it, you know, and, and make them fun and make them make people feel energized and excited by their job descriptions where it's like, oh man, I really make an impact at sure. our company. I matter instead of kind of just this like, like bland, here are the expectations. It can, it can be really, um, kind of mapped out in a way that says we can't hit our goals without you. You are the hero of our organization. Yeah. Um, and we're so excited that you're here. That's awesome. Well, very cool. Uh, now I'm trying to think of all the fun job titles I've ever had in the past. <laughs> Your point, Nathan, of being the job site cleanup, like chief, chief trash operator. I don't know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like 10 years old. And I'm like, Ooh, I'm the trash guy. Cool. Uh, like, whatever gets you psyched to, to do the job. Right. So, okay. So we're talking friends and family. Uh, we've got some job descriptions. We kind of know where we are. We've got that accountability piece and you know, we're, we're doing great. We've got six to 10 employees now. Is, does that kind of start to fall into that, that stage three where you're casting that wider net to hire for a broader group? And kind of what are some of those challenges that come along with that as you do go from, you know, working from working with cousins or brothers and sisters um, to, to that wider net? You know, what is that almost like a trust hurdle? I feel like the business owner needs to get get over to start welcoming in strangers to help them. Well, you start dealing with that issue of like trading the devil, you know, for the one you don't. Um, and write that down. That's a that's a tricky thing. And the only way to really it kind of for me. Your friends and family typically are going to be a lot like you. We just tend to attract things that are like us. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But what that means is that culturally, your friends and family will probably fit pretty well into your organization because you all influence one another. And so like my, my best friend, Mark, if I started a company and it was kind of a good reflection, my buddy Mark would fit in really well there. Okay. Well, what happens when I need to hire somebody who isn't a friend or family member? Yeah. So now all of a sudden we're in this casting a wider net where we have to reach beyond that group of people. Um, we're talking four to 10 million in here. Okay. Yeah. Um, and just so you guys know, these are not hard and fast numbers. They are different for every company. These are just trends and averages we see. Somebody might be listening to this going, oh my gosh, I did way more than that with my friends and family. But good for you. Like, yeah, dude, that's awesome, right? You're, yeah. you're cast, cast maybe, a wider net over here. That's right. That's right. You know? And so when, uh, when we're actively recruiting now, all of a sudden we're not talking about word of mouth processes where it's like, Hey, I'm just asking all my friends, if anybody's interested in this opportunity. Now we need to be diligent about, about advertising for the person we're looking for. And that advertising needs to be attractive to that kind of person, right? So it's a whole different strategy. We need to create a few barriers because we don't just hire anybody with a pulse, despite right. what some people think about contractors. Um, so we need to create some barriers in there. Um, and in these stages, uh, everybody inside the, on the, from the family component, everybody's wearing a lot of hats in our processes. But as we hire people, those people are probably going to wear a lot of hats as well. And so casting that wider net means a whole nother skill set also. And so I'll let Roz kind of jump in on the, the back half of that. Yeah, absolutely. I think because people are really kind of taking a lot of ownership of different parts of your organization, again, that's why those kind of things we mentioned in stage two, you have to have now, it's not an option anymore. Like if you, if you kind of let off the gas a little bit on that stuff and felt like you could wait, if you don't have it by stage three, you're going to be hurting and you're going to be kind of bleeding out people because those are expectations by that level. Um, so then to kind of take it into that next level, I think really you're actively recruiting online, you're accepting applications, like Nathan mentioned, you really want to have a defined hiring and staffing plan at this stage. So having clear plans for prioritization, you might be thinking about, okay, I know I need to add five people to our team this year to really hit our growth goals. Well, with five people, do you need to hire more admins so that your salespeople can really focus on sales? Maybe they've been doing too much paperwork and that's been taking time away from them. Um, do you need to provide, hire some people who can help 
with leads, something like that. So you can start to actually identify what the biggest needs are in your organization. Um, kind of again, where is that time starting to get drawn away? Uh, and then you're actually having a clear priority list of, okay, in those five roles, these are the ones we need to hire first. Um, you're, because you're bringing on more people, you're really going to want to have a clear recruiting, onboarding, and training process structured so that each time um, you're doing it the same way. Otherwise, you're going to waste a lot of time trying to refigure out what questions am I going to ask today? How is it consistent from one person to the next? Oh, yeah, we're bringing on people. How do we do that again? Having those defined onboarding processes will start to make those people that are coming into your organization really feel welcome, um, feel like you've thought about them ahead of time, right? You, yeah, yeah. Okay, you know, you were ready for me to be here. Um, those onboarding processes are super important and your training plan, right? Because if people come into your organization and, and they're not receiving training, they're just going to flounder at that stage. Mm -hmm. um, and the third thing I would kind of say is to start thinking about having defined budgets and compensation plans too. You know, as you're building your sales team, uh, having clarity around what your comp structures are going to look like uh, as you bring in admins, are they going to be hourly? Are they going to be salaried? What are the laws around that? Because there are specific rules. You can't just call anybody you want salaried. Um, <laughs> and so uh, things like that are really good. Uh, and your, your budget, you really have to have clarity around what can we actually afford from yeah. a staffing standpoint this year? Well, let me ask you this. So we're, we're going from that friends and family to this, this uh, kind of stage three, right? That casting wider net. For somebody who's maybe never hired from the outside before, do you have kind of a rule of thumb or, or just a quick tip around, you know, maybe the number of interviews to have? You know, is it something where they go through two interviews and that's it? Do we do we give them six or seven and then we're kind of getting everybody's time involved there? Is there kind of a sweet spot for how to know when you've got the right hire? Yeah, I think rather than trying to like do like a belaboring long interview process, asking the right questions is actually going to be more critical. Um, so you could you could kind of shorten up that process yeah. uh, by by having questions that are aligned to the job, um, aligned to your culture, uh, aligned to the skills and attributes that you're looking for in people. So that's where I'd focus my energy is just really on asking those right questions over you know, having this long drawn out process. Um, one thing that you can do too that can be really powerful is to do shadows. You can do like almost like an informational uh, interview where people get a chance to come out and kind of see what it's like to be a part of your organization. Oh, cool. um, that can be a really attractional way to, to get to know somebody a little bit better before they're even coming on board. That's awesome. All right, very cool. Thanks for the tips. So if you are a stamp collector, do not apply to Nathan's business because these <laughs> guys, you can tell. See you holding that baseball over there. Like no, yeah. no stamp. Well, it's awesome, though. <laughs> I love it. Uh, all right. So, all right, we're going from this kind of uh, casting the wider net. We've got, like you said, we've got onboarding processes in place. We're clear on the job descriptions, salaries. We're starting to get a better idea of if people can be hourly or salary because the laws uh, dictate that, as you said, uh, which uh, there you go, the more you know. Um, what is that next step when you go from, from that casting the, the wider net and getting these more formal processes into, uh, you know, building the scale, as you call it, that, that kind of 10 plus million or, or whatever it may be from a financial perspective, like what is that kind of key indicator the business owner needs to be looking for? Well, what, what's happening now is, uh, is that as our organization grows, we're starting to find, we're starting to find some situations where, um, all of the roles and responsibilities for each one of the hats that everybody wears is has now so much volume around it that that person cannot a wear all those hats and yeah. b they can't even do all the responsibilities in each one of those hats. Mm -hmm. So you know, casting a wider net means we're trying to find a single person for each hat that we have, but then all of a sudden we start to find, and once again, not hard numbers, but ten plus million in that number, we start to see that like even the hats that somebody's wearing, even if they're only wearing one hat, some of the responsibilities, they can't do all of those responsibilities in that side. Now, is that from a time constraint or a skill constraint? Well, it could be both. It could be, it could be straight up capacity. Um, it could be capacity. They just don't have the time to do all of these things. Okay. Now with, as with almost everybody, we have parts of our jobs that we're really, really good at. Yeah. And then we have parts of our jobs that we're 
probably not the best at, but we can do them, right? Yeah. So if we're wearing a hat and we are now, our, our time is, we just don't have enough time any longer. We're past that point, we're capacity, we're maxed out. And we need to take some of the things, some of the duties and responsibilities off of this hat and now put those specific things on somebody else. So it's almost like, if you think about going all the way back to being the one man, one, one, man, one woman show, yeah. okay? And you're looking to, to shift the things that you didn't do well off to somebody else. Think about that exact same concept only across the entire breadth of your staff. And so now, rather than trying to find people who can wear a lot of hats, we're looking for people who can wear very specific hats. They, they, we start to narrow the field of responsibility for people because doing job approvals before going to production used to be a two hour job and my sales manager can handle it. Well, now it's a six hour job because of how much we've grown. And that's just not my, and that's something we need to move to somebody else. And so now we're starting to actually shrink responsibility levels in order to increase the capacity. A lot of people make the mistake of thinking that scaling is simply hiring more people. It right. is not. But with that comes some functional issues that you're going to have to address. Yeah. So, Roz, what, what are those functional issues we got to worry about? Yeah. So at that stage, really, as you're getting more specialized, you're going to really probably have some multi-layer happening, right? What I mean by that is you now need somebody to manage the people that you have in kind of these specialized parts of your business. Um, so with those managers, you really need to be focusing on leadership development. I mean, it's one of the key, most critical things you can do to help your organization be successful is to grow those leaders uh, out of kind of a managerial mindset to truly a leadership, a servant leadership, ideally uh, mindset and giving, giving them the training that they need to get there. Um, a lot of times we start from this mindset of, you know, John was really good at selling. So now John's going to be sales manager. Well, doing is not the same thing as leading. And so right. if we want to give people growth opportunity within our organizations, which of course we do, right? We want to see them grow their careers. We have to be planful on the front end of it and think about how are we going to get that person transitioned to a to that true leadership role yeah. where they see that their job isn't to just go out and sell anymore. It's truly to invest in people, to help them feel like they know how to do one-to-one -one conversations, that they know how to build people up um, and that they know how to give feedback that maybe sometimes is a harder but, but critical conversation. Um, if I can ask a question on top of that. So I'm kind of wondering like, you know, Nathan called out you've got different people that will come in at different stages of the business kind of based on their skill set and needs. And, you know, in this example of somebody that's just killing it from the sales role, uh, they move up to management. Um, what if you realize afterwards that maybe they're not best suited for management? Is it, is it, Hey, sorry, it's been fun. Do you, do you kind of revert them back down to being an individual contributor? What, how do you kind of navigate those waters? First of all, that's, I mean, that's going to come down to leadership number one, a hundred percent. The 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 establishment of the expectations and what we were looking at, because what we we want to try and avoid demoting somebody right. as often as possible. Yeah. Um, I would say probably four out of five times in a demotion scenario, that person's going to leave. They're they're they they they, feel, they might feel embarrassed. They feel uncomfortable. Maybe they're upset. Maybe they thought they were doing well. Most scenarios that person's gone. Um, the only way to really try and avoid that is A, be very careful with who you promote and when you promote them. B, um, giving a trial period. We don't, just, we don't just roll somebody in and go, okay, now you're a leader. We go, hey, how would you like to, how'd you like to run a sales meeting this week? How'd you like to take a couple of the new guys out? How would you write? And we, and we do this and just see how they, they might go, you know what? I really didn't like taking the newbies out. That was, I, they were annoying. They slowed me down and I'm like, Oh, cool. Great. Then you're probably not sales manager material, right? Cause that's what those guys do all the time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, trying to avoid that as much as possible. Cause four out of five times in a situation where that person didn't work out, they're probably going to go. Right on. Yeah, I totally agree. I think it's really, it needs to be managed on the front end. But if you do find yourself in that situation and you want to try to chart those waters forward, um, I 
I think two options. One, really taking a hard look at how you're leading that person. You really need to look yourself in the mirror at like, what are your leadership styles and tactics? <laughs> um, and then two, uh, I think if, if you're going to transition that person out of a leadership role, thinking about how you can still give them advancement opportunities. What can they own? Can they be um, the leader or the, the trainer of how to close deals, if that's what they're really good at, you know, so thinking about what are those areas that they really excel in, that you can still give them ownership of and let them champion, so that they still feel like they're having a contributor role. Mm. Um, but it takes a lot of really honest, uh, caring conversations to make that transition where, um, you know, you're kind of helping them bring them along to yeah. help them see maybe where they can get to that place of like, oh yeah, I agree. This maybe isn't the best fit for me. Cause like Nathan said, if they're thinking they're, they're doing great, um, that's not going to be the place to start from. <laughs> I like that you called out too of, of that, the business owner or the senior leadership really having that look in the mirror to make sure, have I been doing everything I can to set them up for success or did I promote them and didn't just leave them to the wolves? So that's a great tip that I imagine a lot of people are probably a little too afraid to, to have sometimes. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not always fun. Uh, I, I More often than not, it really does come down to a hard look in the mirror. I mean, can yeah. you, you know, if, you, if you've got a, an employee or a team member that's struggling, can you look yourself in the mirror and say, I have done everything I possibly can to help them be successful or that I actually set them up for success? And if the answer is no, which oftentimes it is, um, you got to own it. Yeah. You got to own it and do what's right from that perspective. And I think what you'll find is when you own it, people tend to respond really well. Yeah. Uh, when a leader steps up and owns the fact that they might be failing, like you want to talk about it un unspringing uh, an entirely tense situation. Um, it's just taking that ownership. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a powerful way to, to work through those circumstances. Very cool. Well, that's that's awesome. And like we talked about earlier with you know the, the example of our, of our family business, right? Of could those egos have been put aside and, and look in the mirror and say, you know, could I have done more or did I do uh, everything that I could have, right? It's uh, certainly a tough conversation, but uh, you know, difficult conversations are difficult, but they're absolutely necessary. Uh, yeah. and there's so much growth that comes out of them. Wow. So that's really awesome. Um, well, y'all, I know we're about a time here, so uh, I don't want to keep you too, too much longer here. Cause I know you're both very, very busy coaching people up. So I've got to ask you if there is one just kind of fun learning or pro tip that you've learned, uh, over your time working in the industry, what is that pro tip that you want people to, to be able to walk away and say, Oh, that's a great idea. I should, I should maybe look at implementing that. I don't think this was on the list of questions. No, no, it wasn't, man. This is a casual conversation. We're just having fun. Love it. Now, it, now everyone knows. This. Right? Yeah. Um, I think, I think, uh, gosh, if there's anything that you could implement, I think that would help you on a day-to-day -day basis, it would be uh, as a business owner to um, understand in, to as deep a level as you can what you consider success to be for you because if you don't have a solid grasp of what you're after and what is success in your own mind social media is going to decide for you and in watching other people is going to decide for you and comparing yourself to others is going to decide for you um and that's a horrible road to walk down because yeah. I can tell you right now, there's always somebody out there who's better than you at what you're trying to do. And there's always somebody out there who's further down the road. And you know what? There's also always somebody out there who's willing to lie about yeah. where they are. And comparing yourself to something that's not true is not fair to you or anybody else around you. Absolutely. So avoid, avoid the pitfalls of keeping up with the Joneses, as they say. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think, and for me, I mean, I similar pitfall is this idea that you have to go it alone. Um, I think sometimes we get into this place of um, maybe embarrassment or like, hey, I don't want to tell people that this maybe isn't working or this is really hard or I have these challenges. And so we get a little vulnerable at times around that. Like, you know, I'm the leader. I'm supposed to know this is my business. I should have the answers um, or, you know, it worked before. So I don't know why it's not working now. Um, so we can kind of get into this mindset of like, we have to have all the answers and we just got to keep 
pushing through and go it alone. Um, but I think that's a myth. And the more we start to tap into uh, other resources and be vulnerable and say, like, I actually don't know the answer right now. Um, I think it just gives us, uh, it, well, first of all, it, it demonstrates humility to our team, sure. which then allows everyone around us to grow uh, and to learn, which is a really good place for your business to be. Uh, and two, it, it allows you to see the, the strength that comes from the people around you. You know, when you allow other people to help you, you start to see just how much good there is in the world and how much people really do want to be on your side and they're rooting for you. That's awesome. I would, I would also partner with Signpost. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I won't stop you from throwing me I mean, <laughs> you know, you got to manage that reputation. You got to manage that customer communication and you got to automate your business. And that's basically signpost job description. I don't know why you wouldn't do that. There you go. You heard it first. All right, y'all. Well, uh, Nathan, Roz, really enjoyed the time. Uh, for those that are, are following along, we've got a couple additional resources for you. Uh, first, I want you to go to contractorcoachpro.com forward slash assessment. Great way to just kind of have them do a once over look at your business, uh, give you a better understanding kind of where you are with things. Um, and then as well, uh, below in the YouTube description, we'll have a link out to a PDF that Roz mentioned that's going to bring in some marketing tactics, infographics around the four stages of growing your team. So with that, we really appreciate y'all joining us and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, Tom. Thanks for having us. You got it.